Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Beth I'm an alcoholic. And by the grace of God and his beautiful gift, by the help of you people a day at a time in my life, by the kamikazes that came to my house on that day and have remained with me one day at a time, I have not found it necessary to pick up a drink since March the 5th of 1972. Do you hear something going funny? Oh, I thought it was back to the way it was once. Uh, All I ever heard was organ music. Um, I don't like to get into too much of that stuff. Uh, Anyway, first of all, I want to thank the committee um, for just the privilege of of being here for... uh, all the speakers, I, I have thought they were just, you guys are just special. Um, for you, the fellowship that's taken place here, the enthusiasm, it, God, it's not pockets, it's bushels. Uh, and, and for that wonderful fruit basket that we, that we got, I think I'm gonna put it on my head and tie my scarf around underneath my chin and try to run through O'Hare Airport with that thing. That'll be a, that'll be a difference. It, it's just been, just been a, a wonderful, wonderful weekend. And it's, it's been full of love and full of enthusiasm and full of just, you know, every day is living. And it was just, just a real living experience and one that I will keep way down in, in that part of me that, that belongs to God, that is my soul, and think of you in with very, very warm feelings. There's a lot of friends that I've seen that I haven't seen for a long time, and a lot of new friends, and that's one of the biggest blessings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, can't beat it. God bless you, my dear. Um, I'm a nervous wreck. With those of you who care to, please join me in the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. I I love that prayer. Um, I heard that, really heard it, for the first time when I went to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in 1972 when I meant business and... uh, I fiddled around with AA. I'll get to that. But when I walked into those rooms and I heard that prayer, I wanted to be liked so badly. And I wanted you to like me. Nobody liked me for a long time. Nobody had said anything to me for a long, long time. And and I thought, I, I just, I needed, needed so bad to have you guys like me that, when they said, let us say the serenity prayer, a couple of meetings later, I remember opening my mouth and made sounds come out and wiggled my mouth up and down, see, so that you'd think I knew the serenity prayer and would like me. And that's probably the first time I got the elbow in the rib cage by you-know-who, who was standing next to me. And she said, you don't need to pretend anymore, Beth. If you stay in these meeting rooms and you take the cotton out of your ears and you shove it in your mouth and you really listen and hear, I promise you that the day will come when you can say the serenity prayer. And I stayed in those meeting rooms and I listened and the day came. And I can remember the meeting and I know, I know who was there. I know who was on either side of me. I know who was across the table from me. And I said the serenity prayer and I knew something. I knew that you didn't lie to me. I knew that if I stayed in these meeting rooms and I listened and I heard 
what you were saying, that that promise that you had also made me of that it will get better would happen. And I understand today it will get better means that I get better inside of me and that in spite of the stuff that comes into my life, that every day I could live and I could be happy and I could be free and I could feel that joy that Ken talked about last night and all the speakers have talked about. And, and then my sponsor said, you know, that serenity prayer says a lot. It says to you that you're the problem, Beth. You've always been the problem. It wasn't where you were brought up, how you were brought up, what happened in your life. Blah, you picked up the first drink. You're the problem. And you will always be the problem. And the thing of it is, if you keep your attitude where it should be, and you keep trying to change this, that you will remain happy in your 24-hour periods of time. You know, some people said to me around here, you're always smiling. You always have a smile on your face. Well, there's a twofold reason for that. I'm real grateful to be here. And the second reason is, is that when I came into AA, I was told to smile and give my face something to do while the rest of me was running around in meetings so it wouldn't feel left out. <laughs> and so I smile, and I feel better. Also, they said what this serenity prayer means is that you change you. You can't change anybody else. And you know, I tried all my life. I was always trying to change people and everything else. I always thought it was them and not me. And it never worked. It always backfired. And today I know that I have to change myself. I wouldn't want to change you guys. Now, look at you. You're all individuals. You, you all, we work this program because it is the program, but sometimes we do little different ditties, and we come to these meetings and we share the little ditties, and, and then we can learn from those. I do, and I take home the one thing of value that I hear at every single AA meeting, because I was told to do that. And it's those little things of value that can save my life tomorrow. And it's simple stuff. It's simple stuff. And they said the wisdom to know the difference will come with time. And a lot of mistakes. And you learn from your mistakes. That's a wonderful thing about this this fellowship. You know, I didn't have to be perfect. I didn't have to be perfect. They say we strive for perfection. And we learn from our mistakes. And, and that's wonderful. That's wonderful for me. So I love that prayer, and I say it a lot every day. When I had five years of sobriety, uh, they said to me, there's a shorter version that you can say, you know, let go and let God and live and let live, and that'll take a shorter time. Then when I had 10 years of sobriety, they said, I can say the shortest version of it all, the hell with it. And I do that a lot to myself, because I was told to clean up my mouth when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I love this program. I love this way of life. I know that the woman I was will drink again. I don't want to go back there at all. And, and because we have to share a little bit about, you know, what it, what it used to be like and then what happened and, and what it's like today. Uh, I'll just tell you this. I picked up my first drink when I was in my 20s. I didn't like alcohol. Um, I'd grown up with it. And uh, it, it, that doesn't make any difference. I mean, heck, I grew up with a bunch of alcoholics. The smartest thing I could have done was not to ever drink, you know, but I did. Because I'd stuffed stuff for so long. There, it, and it wasn't because there weren't people in my family who weren't willing to listen. And it wasn't because it was all bad all the time. They did the best they could with what they had. I know that today. My mom started to drink and and uh, got into alcoholism when I was a teenager. And I spent most of my life taking care of my stepbrother. There's nine and a half years younger than me. I never thought of him. As my stepbrother, he was always my brother, and I don't think I liked him until I got to be about 30. He used to send in, you know, I mean, patience and tolerance. He used to send in box tops and 25 cents to Tom Mix, you know, and he'd get these doggone periscope things, and he could hide behind the Davenport when I had, you know, the captain of the football team was sitting there and just about to make an advance. And up over the top of the Davenport would come the scope. I could have trilled the kid. Anyway, <clears throat> and I had to bring him up because my mother was never around. And, and my, my stepfather, whom I have thought of my father all the time, was the kindest, dearest man. And, and he was willing to listen. 
And, and I just never shared anything. I always wanted to feel like other people looked. And, and so I, I would put on this big act and, and make you think that I felt just like you looked. And I really didn't. I, I thought that you were having fun. And so I made this big effort to try to have fun. But I didn't feel ever like I was having fun until I came into the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. My first father was murdered before I was born. My mother was three months pregnant as a direct result of alcohol. And my mother's three sisters, two of them died in their very early 40s. One died by jumping out a window after a bottle of scotch. My uncle said she thought she was a burden, went right through a 14-story window. And I remember that like it was yesterday because my mother was taking me to visit her, and I had my suitcase in hand, and my Aunt Poe landed right next to me on the pavement, still hanging on to a bottle. My Aunt Jean had 11 years of uninterrupted sobriety in Alcoholics Anonymous, and she stopped going to meetings. And you know and I know if you stop going to meetings, it's it's tragic. So I didn't like alcohol, and I got married, and I married the finest man that ever walked the face of the earth. He lived the 12 steps. He was not an alcoholic, and he was gentle, and he was kind. And I just never felt like it was how it should be. And so we were at a party once, and somebody said to me, why don't you smile? Because I never did. If I didn't smile, I felt gloomy and doomy. And and so why don't you smile? Why don't you learn to have a good time? Here, why don't you have a drink? And the old hand shot out, and I picked up that drink, and I drank that thing, and by God, it did wonders. It made me feel all warm on the inside. My mouth could go like this, and I didn't care anymore what anybody thought. And I could say what I wanted to say, and I went in the bathroom, and I looked in the mirror, and my God, I looked like Elizabeth Taylor. And this stuff was for me. You know, I, I no longer was as short as I was. I no longer had this funny ear thing that I do. You know, I got a spock ear. It's kind of got a point on it. I tell everybody I sponsor it beeps in on what they're doing, so they better be careful. <laughs> Turn anything around in this thing. Um, and, and alcohol moved into my life fast. And it made me feel wonderful for about three weeks. And then it started to remove. Now, I don't know if you know what an art gum eraser is. We used to have them when, when we were kids. And some of you are, <clears throat> well, as old as I am. Um, and so you remember. And if you don't know, go buy one. And write something in pencil on a page. And, and do with the art gum eraser across it. And it fades things out. It doesn't immediately erase it. It fades things out into the page. And that's exactly what alcohol did in my life. It started to fade things out. After five years of drinking, my husband told me I had a drinking problem. The rat. I better go to Alcoholics Anonymous and do something about my drinking. I wasn't that bad. And I didn't think I had a drinking problem. He was just stingy, never gave me enough allowance, so I'd, I'd write a check. <clears throat> or I'd go to the savings account and I'd draw money out and um, not tell him I'd forget. And everybody forgets. And, and, you know, I was starting to take stuff out of the house and sell it down in Cleveland at a pawnbroker. And um, he started to keep inventory of what was going on. <laughs> he never cared about that stuff. And then all of a sudden he'd say, where is the sterling silver spoon? And I'd say, what spoon? And I never did, I never did anything that bad, I didn't think. You know, I had a little girl, and, and, and uh, we'd moved to Cleveland. I was born and raised in a suburb of Chicago, and we moved to Cleveland, and then you know, I was doing okay, I thought. I um, got on the wine, rock and juice. It got me to the moon. I was up on the moon planting the flag while NASA was still thinking about how they were going to do it. I could have saved us taxpayers millions, but they never asked me. Um, I 
discovered it because we had liquor stores, state liquor stores in Ohio, and you had to go in and sign your name every time you wanted a bottle. Well, I'd sign my name, and I thought, oh, God, and then I'd sign Tizzy Lish and Emma Glutz and, and all these different names, and then I thought, God, maybe the FBI is going to come looking for me. What they wanted with a little white-gloved suburban housewife sherry sipper is something I don't know. Anyway, that's when I found the sherry, and I found the wine, and it was cheap, and it was accessible. You know, and it comes in all different kinds of sizes, which are great. You can buy the large economy size and pour it into different things. Or you could buy it, you know, in little pints and stick it down your front, and you wouldn't even make a lump when you walked into the house. It fit in your purse in the glove compartment and behind the toilet bowl. It was wonderful stuff. And then they had, you know, the big fifth things of it. Now, after much thought, it was, I thought, well... See, what happened with me was my writing started to go. I don't know about your writing, but after I drank, I never could write real well, and I never could make maps real well. And I used to, when I hid these bottles and stuff, and I'd make maps, and I'd write myself a note where I hid it because my thinking was starting to get strange, and I couldn't remember things, you know, where I hid it. And it took me a long time, and it made me real frustrated to have to go around looking for this stuff. So I painted them white. We have a white house. So I paint the wine bottles white, and I hang them out of the window on a white rope. Um, and I looked, and I didn't see them hanging there. I went out and checked. And it was easier for me to hoover on the second floor, and instead of wasting all that energy and having all that frustration to run downstairs and look for stuff, I could I just would do up the rope, you know, and take a little slug and put it back down and get on with my hoovering. Um, one day my husband called me outside, and he said, what's that? And I said, I don't see what you mean. <laughs> and he said, you stand there. I'm going down the street to get Marty. Marty was his best friend. He said, don't you move. I said, I won't. Promise. <laughs> you know. And um, he left. And the minute he got around those bushes... I broke every Olympic record, going up the stairs, hauling the bottles, under the bed, everything, ran downstairs and was standing in the front yard, not even breathing hard, when he came back with Marty. And he said, Marty, she's going crazy. Look what she's doing. And Marty looked and he said, Bruce, are you all right? I don't see you. And they say we don't affect the families. <laughs> anyway, those were a few of the little ditties I was doing. And he said to me, you've got to go to this Alcoholics Anonymous. So I went around AA for the first of three times. I wasn't honest. I didn't have an open mind. I heard your stories. Gosh, you went to jail. You were having divorces. You left this. You left that. That never happened to me. Yes. What a word. One word, yet, it packs the power of an atomic bomb. If it hasn't happened to you yet, I guarantee you, if you go out these doors and you drink, it's going to happen. It will. And I wasn't willing. I wasn't willing to stay there. I wasn't willing to do the simple things I was asked to do. And two years later, the social service workers were in our house because the neighbors had started to report that there was screaming going on in the house, the violence had started, that I was driving drunk in the car with the children, that I was showing up in all these places over town in not very good shape. Um, you know, I was doing things too bad once I went up the driveway, our driveway, which I thought was good. I didn't make a mistake and go up somebody else's. I went up my own driveway. But instead of braking, I accelerated. And I got into the kitchen quick. Um, 
all these things were going on, also at this time, I had another little girl. And uh, she had the measles. And I was in the kitchen, and I was making a wine cooler for myself in the morning. And Annie, my youngest, came and tugged on my skirt and said, Something's the matter with Kimberly, Mom. And I told her to go away. I told her she was making it up and to leave me alone. I was busy. When I got into the living room, from what the neurosurgeons could figure out, Kimberly was on her fourth violent convulsion. She retrogressed back to a three-week-old baby. We had to put her in a private home. And she ultimately died when she was eight years old. I worked through that with forgiveness, which I'll talk to you about later. Anyway, the social service worker said you'll have one more chance. We don't care if you're married. We don't care about anything. You go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went around to AA and I played the same game. I went to one meeting a week, too. I don't know of any kid ever who passed from one grade to the next going once a week to school, and I do not think it can be done in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm not speaking for AA. I'm telling you how I feel. Meetings are important. This is our classroom. This is where we learn how to live, how to be free, how to have fun. And if you don't go, you don't learn. And if you don't learn, we die. It's just that simple. A couple of years later, a judge looked at me over a thing like this. I was in a lot of trouble. I had quite a few DWIs, which my husband always got me out of. I also had had a run-in with a Summit County Sheriff. Now, this guy came to get me out of some soft burn. He saw the bottle sitting on the seat next to me. He saw two empties on the, on the uh, floor, and he strongly suggested he take me home. And I didn't want him to because I didn't, well, I wonder what the neighbors would think. The neighbors probably would stand out there and say, finally, yay, it's about time. And I got mad at him. So I hit him over the head with my wine bottle. <laughs> he had 24 stitches and a headache. So I found myself shackled to this wonderful 450-pound matron. And I had my picture taken. That's a wonderful experience. You get numbers under your neck. And I was terrified. And this judge said to me, I'm going to put you in the workhouse for 90 days. Or you go to Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't want to go to the workhouse. They wore striped suits. And I didn't think I looked good in stripes. So I went around to AA and I played the same game. And the next four years were dynamite. It takes you down, alcohol does into a deep dark pit where there's no time, there's no there's no days, there's nothing. There's no sunrises, there's no sunset. It's just your loss. Lonely, full of fear, jumped every time the phone would ring. Got to the point I didn't get dressed, I didn't cook, I didn't do anything. I look out the window every so once in a while and, and I'd see all the women out there with their shiny hair and they were laughing. And they were waiting at the bus with their children. My children were standing over here. Nobody lets their kids play with the kids of a drunk after a while. I wanted to be out there in that sunshine. I wanted to be with my children. And I didn't understand why. And the pain was so intense, I got rid of it the only way I knew how. By drinking. In 1968, I had a little boy, and he lived eight days, and he died. Today they call it the fetal syndrome. Jeffrey was born an addict. Jeffrey was fed whiskey out of an eyedropper every couple hours. He tried to pull him through it, and he just didn't. 
My husband came to get me the day after he was born. The doctor suggested he do it because somebody had put a sign on my door that said murderous. You know, when I came to you, you waited until I came to believe in a power greater than myself that I choose to call God before you taught me about forgiveness. Because forgiving myself was very, very hard for me to do. And you said to me, God, in all his wisdom, has given you the beautiful gift of life. Who are you not to forgive yourself, Beth? And that's what got me through that. And on March the 4th, of 1972, sitting at, at a kitchen table all alone. I drank the last thing I had in the house and in the morning. It was the first time that horrible feeling didn't get in there. Oh, my God, I've run out. And, and it's the first time I didn't hit the rubbing alcohol and the cologne and the shaving lotion and the extracts and all those things to get through it. I sat there, and I watched my family go to church. Nobody said anything. They hadn't for a long time. But I saw everything that I had done and everything that I had become written all over those faces, and I knew something. I knew it all the way down into that place that belongs to my God, as I understand him, called my soul. And I knew I was an alcoholic. And I knew the problem was me. And I knew I had screwed up my life. Because I was powerless over alcohol. I call it a spiritual experience. Ken talked about that. And I think that was the first spiritual experience that I had. No bells rang. Nothing shot out of the kitchen cupboard. Nothing came out of a bush from outside. It was just there. And I crawled to the phone. And I yanked it off the wall. And I called my Aunt Jean in Chicago. And she said to me, what is the name of the old timer who has never given up hope on you? And his name is Jerry Jackson. And Jerry died in 1978 with 30 some years of uninterrupted sobriety. I had met Jerry in 1962 when I went around AA for the first time. And Jerry kept coming over to the house to see my family. He literally glued them together. I did not find until five years later when I was looking in the attic commitment papers to Lima State Hospital. Lima State Hospital is a place for the insane in Ohio. And the commitment papers were there, and they were all filled out, and the only thing that wasn't on there was my husband's signature. And I asked him about that, and he said, my God, I thought I threw those out. And on Christmas of 1971, I had tried to murder my girls and my husband, and uh, he went and saw about committing me. After that, and he had the papers, and Jerry Jackson had come over to the house, and he had talked to Jerry. I don't know what they said to each other, but the papers were never signed. So Jerry literally had come in and glued them together. And Bruce had carried on with those kids. He took them to church. He took them to ball games. He did all the things to make their lives a little bit manageable. They didn't like that book called Mama Dearest. My daughter told me that Mama Dearest was like reading a little red riding hood next to what happened in our family. It was a nightmare. But on this day, Jerry came over on March the 5th. I called him. And he came after I'd hung up for my Aunt Jean. And Jerry came into the house and he said, Beth, the road isn't going to be easy. Nothing in life that's worthwhile is easy. But I'll promise you something. If you'll take our hands and come along the road with us, it'll be better. It'll be better. You'll learn to walk in the sunshine. 
And then the kamikaze hit. Into the house they came. And you know what they did? They sat down at the kitchen table, and they told me things about myself I never wanted anybody to know. And you know what they were doing? They were just sharing their stories with me. They were just sharing their feelings with me. And then I heard them talking over in the corner, and they said, God, is she sick? <laughs> her hair is coming out. She's got those wine sores that are running like in Batigo. You know, her teeth are funny looking. And I weighed uh, probably not even 70 pounds, because who eats when they drink? Um, she needs to go to the hospital. Well, I'll tell you, we had at that time Rosary Hall. And Rosary Hall uh, did not take women then. It was closed. They were going to open a woman's ward, and they were painting the walls pink and hanging up polka dotty curtains or something. And uh, St. Thomas Hospital had a waiting list of four and a half weeks, and there was another place called Serenity Hall, and they didn't take women at all. So my sponsors decided nobody had ever died on them yet. Nobody was going to start. And off we went, three and four meetings a day. Top two and three, always, every day, for the first nine months I was sober. Once I picked up the telephone to call my sponsor to tell her I was too tired to go. <laughs> you know, everybody's told you what their sponsors have said. All I never did was go. Hmm. That was all. Hmm. I said, I am too tired to go to the meeting. Silence. Hmm. And then she said, if you think you're tired, what do you think we are? <laughs> Suit up, we're going to show up, and we'll be there in ten minutes. That's what they kept saying to me, suit up and show up. That's all you have to do. Suit up and show up. Who cares? What else? And then they can I never did that again. I never did that. But it was in those meeting rooms. You know what I heard? I heard we. Not I, me, my, mind. I heard we. I didn't feel alone. We are powerless over alcohol. Our lives have become unmanageable. There were other people, too. And I took the cotton out, and I put it in the mouth, and I learned to listen and hear. And, you know, people throw in little things like, God gave you two ears and one mouth. What do you think that means? You know, and I think for a while, and then I didn't think. And they told me not to think. And I've heard that from up here this weekend, too. You don't think. You follow directions. And then, you know what? You gave me certain little things that I had to do in order to stay sober. And before you got into that, my sponsors took me down to a duck pond. Because my mind was so fuzzy, it was easier for me to understand if I saw a picture or I saw something happening. And they took me down to a duck pond, and they said, What do you see? And I said, Ducks. <laughs> and they said, What are they doing? And I said, They're gliding along. You can't even see a ripple in the water. They look peaceful. And they said, all right, now hold your nose, stick your face under the water, open your eyes, and come on up and then tell us what you saw. I was so grateful they told me to come up. I did what they said. Um, so I did it. And when I came up, they said, what did you see? And I said, their little legs are going around like this under the water. They said, that's right. If you want that serenity that you see, you've got to get into action. Your little legs have to go around. Because the minute your little legs stop to it, just like the ducks, you're going to sink. And you're going to drown. And AA isn't going to come to you and hand you serenity and sobriety on a silver platter. You've got to work for it. So then I went back, we went to all these meetings, and somebody said to me, it's very important you stay away from the first drink. And I looked at them like they were crazy. I never had one drink in my life. I don't know about you. I never was a social drinker. Ha <laughs> ha. Closest I ever came was when somebody said, I think I'll have another drink. And I said, so shall I. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you get it? 
That's the only joke I know, for God's sake. <laughs> That's when I was invited out of the meeting. You know where I was invited? And I heard it from Winnie yesterday. I was invited across the field. I was invited to sit down on a railroad track. They said it's right out there. Cross field, go sit on the railroad track, teach patience and tolerance while you're waiting for the choo choo. And then when it comes along and it runs over, you get up off the track, come on back into the meeting, and tell us how you feel. Oh, I wasn't that crazy. I said, I'll never make it back, I'll be dead. In fact, I'll be dead when the engine runs over me, and the whole room exploded and said, Right on, it's the engine that kills you, not the caboose. It's the first drink that pulls something up here over which you have no physical control. Now, I've had people ask me after a meeting, what if the train is running in reverse and the caboose comes first? I don't pull things apart and analyze and all that kind of bull. As far as I'm concerned, since I have been born when Lincoln was president of the United States, the engine has always pulled the choo-choo. <laughs> so I could understand what they were saying. But I never could stay away from the first drink one day at a time. I have never been able to work this program one day at a time. i got to do it right now. Right now, I could stay away from that first drink when that god-awful compulsion used to come before it was gracefully removed from my life. Right now, you gave me things to do. And you know, that still works today with negative thinking. Just because I've been sober... A few 24 hours doesn't mean that everything is happy and wonderful and nothing's coming into my life. I got like, I've been through the valleys. But I know what to do about it right now. If I wait five minutes, I'm in trouble. If I get a resentment, yeah, I get those. And I wait, it gets worse. I got to get rid of it right now. And you told me how to do that. And you know what? You've never used me for an experiment. You've always told me what has helped you, and I've heard it here in AA meetings all over the place. Meetings I go to to figure out how I can keep this in a good, orderly direction. And, and so I heard things like, get 25 phone numbers, put them up by the wall, by your phone. I said, I have a phone book. And my sponsor said, what good is a phone book going to do you when your insides start churning around? How are you going to remember where the Sam Hill you put the dog on thing? And you'll get more frustrated as you look. If they're there by the phone, you can pick up the phone and see them and dial. And the reason for 25 is, if you dial the first number and the line's busy, because the person has the audacity to be talking to somebody else when you need them, you don't need to get a resentment and say, nuts on the whole thing. You go on to the second number. And if that person happens to be going on with the everyday living of life and being out of their house, you don't get a pity party. You go on to the next number. Somebody in those 25 are going to be there. And I still have them there. And they're there, and they're by my phone at work, and they are by the phone upstairs. They're there. Yes, they've changed over the years because people have gone to the big meeting in the sky. But they're there, and boy, I go right for that with the first negative thought. I have to do that today. You also told me something. Don't let a buzz in your head that you can never be a social drinker. You're going to read a lot of stuff in the paper. That Hoosie took 50 people and made them into social drinkers. And they said, now they're all dead or crazy. But what you do is this. You can't. You're an alcoholic. And it's like being a cucumber growing in a garden. And there you are, all green and wonderful, growing in the garden. And one day somebody comes along and picks you. And they put you in a barrel. And it smells in there. And it's awful. And they put the lid on and it's dark. And you're lonely. And then one day they take the top of the barrel off. We don't know whether it's two weeks, a year, months, whatever it is. And they take you out 
and you have become a pickle. And you have to start learning to live like a pickle because there's no way in Sam Hill a pickle can ever be a cucumber again. And it registered. And they also told me to buy a jar of pickles and to keep them in the refrigerator as a constant reminder that once I was a cucumber, I am now a pickle, and I can never be a cucumber again as hard as I try. I have never seen a pickle that's returned to a cucumber. I haven't in all these years. And I still have a jar in my refrigerator. Not the same jar, for God's sake. But, you know, I keep it there, and I'll open the refrigerator, you know, ha, hi, Red Stepper, you on the day. You know, and talk to those pickles. Because they never can go back, and either can I. And that helps me with <laughs> any of those dumb, crazy thoughts. And I was told to read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous two pages a day out loud. So it would go in through this thing and get down into here. And they told me to start in the flap. And the stories could come in time. And to keep going. And that it was the greatest love story that I would ever read, and it is. Look around this room. You want to see a miracle? Look around this room. We should be dead. We should be insane. Our family should have a long time gone. And here we are, happy and joyful and free. You know why? Because the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous is a miracle. A miracle giving a way of life to people who by all judgment of society ought to be dead, gone, buried, locked up, something else. It's a miracle of life, that big book, and it tells us what to do a day at a time in order to put one foot in front of the other and just trudge along. And if you get antsy because you don't like to take it on the bus or you don't, look how smart they got. They came out with this thing. I love this thing. This is a big book, little pocket, little big, big book. You know what they did? For those who, who don't want, who are really anonymous, they've made it like all in color so you really can't see what you're reading unless you get it way up here. <laughs> There are no excuses. I was told that. I ran out of excuses the day I put my foot through the door without calling synonymous. I had no excuses. I was told to read the 24-hour book. We read that in Ohio. I was told to read the meditation of the day, and I was told to do that four times a day out loud, so it will go in here, to here, and down here. And I still do that today. I've underlined in the big books. I'm on my fourth big book. And I have the first edition and the second edition and the third edition, and they're underlined and things are written in the margin, and it is a miracle, and it changes. And there's, it answers any question that we have that big book. I was told there are musts in there. There aren't you betters. There are musts. And I was told to count them. So when it gets to be winter and the snows come and you, you're in the house frustrated, if you can't get out, just count the musts. They're there, and I'm not going to tell you how many there are. God, it took me two and a half years to come up with the right answer. I'm not dumb enough to tell you. Anyway, <laughs> so, and then they told me to buy Winnie the Pooh and read it. And for those of you who do not know, it's a child's book about a bear called Winnie the Pooh. And they said, we want you to read it, and we don't ever want you to become like Eeyore. I said, who's Eeyore? And they said, read it and find out. And I read it. Eeyore is this whiny donkey that lives in a field. And no matter what happens, whether the sun is shining, whether anything, he always is down in the dumps. <laughs> they said, be more like Tigger, who bounces along, loving every minute of life, and not giving a rat's ass about his little problems. <laughs> They also told me to read The Little Engine That Could. I think I can, I think I can, I know I can. I thought I could. And I still read those. And, and by God, the people I sponsor have to read those. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Winnie the Pooh, you're crazy. No, I'm not. 
Just don't be like Eeyore. Whine around. Good grief. I was told to do things like that. I was also told to get outside of myself and do something nice for somebody. To take him a flower or, or to send him a card or, or to start to wave or to smile. That's the cheapest thing to ever see somebody come walking towards you, walking on their face. Smile at them and watch what happens. No, they're not going to hit you over the back of the head. Watch what happens. I have never seen anything but shoulders go back and people start to whistle and, and people step lighter and we can only keep what we try to give away. And it makes you feel better too. A smile might be the only thing that anybody has ever given them in their life. Those were a few of the ditties. Also, take a bath. Take a bath. First, it was out of need. Take a bath. Get in the bathtub. Ah, you relax. Read the big book in the bathtub. If it gets wet, buy another one. You know? <laughs> and I took a lot of baths. And I learned to like it because I remember the time I crawled into the bath when I was so sick and smelled so bad and thought if I could scrub off what was on the outside, the inside might feel like you look. And I went to turn on the water and I couldn't even do that. Alcohol is removed the right. So you better believe every time I turn on water, boy, whether to get a drink of water or to brush my teeth or, or to take a bath, I know it's because of the grace of God and this program that I can do things like that. And it's the simple little things in life like that. I can stand in the bathroom to take a shower. I remember when I did that once. I was naked and I had a fifth. And I was drinking it. And the window went up and the man who was putting on the aluminum siding of the house looked through the window. What do you do? I step behind the shower curtain. But those things don't happen anymore. I knew I was insane. I had no problem with a second step at all. I knew I was nuts, and I didn't want to be nuts. And then you said to me, hey, take off your bedroom slippers at night. And when you kneel down, shove them under your bed, and while you're down there, say thanks. And I said, to who and for what? Ha! <laughs> You looked at me and you said you've been sober 24 hours. That's enough to say thank you for. And you'll find out who you're talking to. Don't push the river, Toots. It runs by itself. You know, easy does it and do it. And in the morning when you wake up and lay there and listen to the sounds of the beginning of the day, they didn't tell me to rush up and get on a trampoline. <laughs> Poor little skinny thing. Um, they said, listen to the sounds of the house. And I did. Listen to the sounds of the day. Listen to the sounds of the house. You know, I still do that. It's the beginning of life for that day. You hear breeze blowing through the trees. You can hear birds waking up. You, you can hear rain on the roof sometimes. You, you can even hear snow. It, it's just the beginning of God's day. Just when he's kind of washing the world. And, and, and you can hear the breathing of life that you're living with in the house. If you're breathing and you don't live with anybody, you better dial 911. <laughs> and then they said, then get out and, and get on your knees and grubble around for your bedroom slippers and remind yourself that you're an alcoholic, the problem is you, and then ask to make lemonade out of the lemons of life that are tossed your way and get up and get on with this thing called living and I did it because I wanted to be sober more than I wanted to be drunk, and I found out who I was talking to, and I call him God. And I love him. He's my dear, dear friend. He never went anywhere. I just did. And he's kind, and he loves us to laugh. 
and I knew he had given me a gift, a gift of life. And like any gift, I got to take care of it. You know, it's like getting a Monopoly set or something. You know, you're real tickled to get it, and you play with it, and it's such fun. And you pick up all the hotels and the houses, and you're real careful of it, and you, you stick it all in the box, and you put it away. And then you take it down again, and you have fun with it. But when you become careless, and you lose a hotel over there, or a house over there, or a community chest somewhere, the day will come when you can't play the game. And I don't want that to happen with my sobriety. My God does not make junk. My God has carried me through many dark places in my sobriety to you guys on the other side. I have a God bag. It's a paper sack and it says to God. I wrote it on the, on the outside. And every negative thought that I have during the day, I write down. And I make that telephone call. And then at night, I put all that negative stuff in, in, in during the day in, in, into the God bag. And I, and I get it out. And the things that I can turn around, I do. And the things that I have any question about, I just put it in the God bag and throw it away. Give it to God. I have never asked why me. It's the dumbest thing to ask. First place, you never get an answer. It's a waste of oxygen. And in the second place, why not me? Obviously, I am never given anything in a 24-hour period of time that I can't do anything about right now with God's grace and 12 steps of life. And you guys. If we put all our problems into a basket and pass them around, I'll bet you we all walk out with our own. I don't want yours, you don't want mine. And I've never put a question mark where God has put a period. I'm questioning stuff he does. I ask every day for my daily bread. And sometimes I don't like it. It's got mold on it. But I ask for it. And God will help me through it. God will help me through it. They say to call heaven. The line is never busy. He puts me on hold a lot. You know, I'll dial it up and I'll up, we'll put it on hold. That's so I can do the footwork. I went into a house once where some guy was sitting in there and he was drunk again. I went in with a male member of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is always very smart to do. And, and I went in there and, and here he was sitting. And, and, and my friend said to him, why? What, what's going on here? We haven't seen you in a long time. What are you sitting here for? He said, I asked God to get me a job. And he hasn't. And we said, did you read the want ads? No. Did you pick up a telephone? No. Did you go pounding on doors? No. I just asked God for a job. Well, no job is going to come to this guy's house. you got to do the footwork. My God is very loving and kind. And my God gave me the strength with you to work through that fourth and fifth step. You know, the task in front of you is never as great as the power behind you. Never. And with that fourth step, I got rid of all the yesterdays of my life. And the fifth step, that's what it's for. The problem is me. And with 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, I don't have to go running around to ABCD and EFG meeting and HIJ. I don't need that stuff. I find it in here. My yesterdays are gone. And what I have is today. I have taken five, four, and fourth and fifth steps since I have come into the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And they're thorough and they're searching. And the reason for so many is because there was a lot of stuff in the first one that I could not, even with searching and fearless, couldn't come up with. I was, obviously, I wasn't ready. I didn't know how to turn anything over. Nothing. I'd ask some the kamikaze something, and she'd say, turn it over to God, after she went, hmm. Um, I didn't know how. So they said, did anybody ever fix it for you? Anything. And I said, yes. My old Scotch grandfather, who used to fix everything. 
And I remember a time, because my sponsor asked me about a specific time, and I remembered a time when the doggy chewed the arms off my raggedy. And I was reminded this yesterday when the prayer was read, because I remember going to this man's lap. I climbed up on his lap. He, he, he just, and he used to hold me, and I had the best feeling. And um, just like I do when I'm on, climb up in a God's lap, and, and um, he hugs me. And I, I said to my grandpa, I had the raggedy in one hand and the arms in the other, and I said, Grandpa, will you fix it? Now, I didn't care how he did. I didn't give him orders how I wanted it done. With his childlike trust, I knew he would do it as best he could. I didn't care if the arm was up here and on the belly button, for God's sake. You know, I, I gave it to him. I remember him saying, Beth, you let go of it so I can sew the arms back on. And I have to think about that. And I made my amends. I had to, I have many amends to make to my family that I made, and and as I live in this program, by living this program, I remember I've been sober for a while. My husband found this old douchebag. <laughs> back behind some towels, and he said, "God, what is this for?" He said, it smells like a got wine. And I said, well, I'll tell you. That's about a couple of the places that they never found. It was where I when I would hide it in the douchebag and the animal bottles. <laughs> and then when you're constipated, you can just go in the bathroom and hang up the damn thing and click off the hoozy with a hose. Same with the douchebag. Don't know what you missed, do you? Um... <laughs> So I said I was sorry and all that, but I think our steps are ongoing. And, and the only time I got into trouble was when I went down the street to make my amends to the neighbor for vomiting on her white carpet and throwing a chair through her sliding glass door. <laughs> and she said, I told her I joined AA. She said, I don't care if you joined the Foreign Legion. Once a drunk, always a drunk. She slammed the door and she caught me right in the nose and boy, the thing went crack. And I went home and called my sponsor crying like a York. And she said to me over the phone, now you've learned the lesson. You do what you should do. And how they take it, that's their problem. And I learned that. And then I asked for those awful, horrible character defects to go and the little shortcomings and all that, and above the tenth step, it, it, you know, that, that taught me about giving the other guys the right to be right and the right to be wrong. And we use the absolutes, honesty, purity, and selfishness and love up there. We know they're not absolute, but they help us to strive. Because I was told to dry, you know, start with a dry basement and lay a linoleum of the absolutes. And there were four questions that were real important. Before I opened the hole in my mouth, I ought to remember these four questions. Is what you are about to do or say right or wrong? Is what you are about to do and say ugly or beautiful? Is what you are about to do and say true or false? And how will it affect the other guy? I wish I could remember those all the time. My mother used to say, the world is a looking glass, and what you see in it is a reflection of yourself. And I think this is why it's important to look for the good in every single human being. I have no right to judge. Is it kind? Is it necessary? To be good and to be kind is one of the blessings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Keep a con- just contact with God. I talk to him all the time. I love him. He's, he's a real peach. He's never come down and taken me out for a hamburger or anything yet. But I, I just love God. God is to me, he, he just, he gave me the privilege and the gift of life. And and you guys are teaching me how to live. It's just that simple. No, I didn't practice my practice the principles in all my affairs. I was a great wife and mother. And I was going to all these meetings and I wasn't drinking. They better watch out what they did or they said or I might get drunk. 
pushing it in and twisting it again. There wasn't any air and then around us then. There wasn't air team, there wasn't any of that stuff. My home group heard, I got a home group. I don't know if you guys have a home group, but I have a home group. Oh God, they've got big ears. They know what you're doing and saying and they don't even need to be there and they heard. You know what the people in the home group do? Did you ever drive down the freeway on a Monday morning when you're late and you have to be to work? And you know who you get behind? 20 miles an hour on a freeway, looking with passion at the abutment. And you can't go around him, and you can't do anything, and I know what I want to do with that car. And I forget the serenity prayer and all that stuff because I'm not that well. And you know who drives up beside me? Toot, toot. Woo-hoo. A member of the home group. Oh, yes. God grant me this. <laughs> If you're in the supermarket on Saturday, every man in the United States wants to go into the supermarket on a Saturday. There they are, arms out, like they're a defensive halfback. And they march down the center of the aisle in slow motion with that basket, gazing with obscene thoughts at the chicken noodle soup. And you say, excuse me, because you want to get by, because you want to get on with it, see? And they hear nothing. They're looking at the soup. And I want to take my basket, and the blood boils, and everything shoots out of the head, and yoo-hoo, out of the olives, a member of the home group. <laughs> oh, yes, God grant me the serenity, so you take your basket and you back up. And they're, they're everywhere. They come out of the sewers. They come out of the <laughs> Mittens and wars, they're just all over the place. Thank God for them. I only miss my home group. I am, I'm missing it this morning. It's on a Sunday morning. You know what I have to do to be here? I got to take kitchen duty for two months. That's it. I don't miss my home group unless I'm out of town or I'm dead. And that hasn't happened yet. They heard, they said you go home and you treat them like you treat members of Alcoholics Anonymous. After all. And I went home and I did. I started out by shaking their hands, huh? The <laughs> mother. You know the warmth of that handshake? You know that handshake in the mountains? The first handshake I got in the meeting just sent shivers down me. It still does. It's, you know, to take a cold hand in your warm one. That's physical contact. I hadn't had any for years when I came to AA, and my family hadn't had any. We didn't hug anymore. We didn't do anything. And things started to change. Because I held on to that wonderful thing called hope. That we sometimes have to hang on to when the chips are down. And that Jerry Jackson had given that to my family. And I recognized what that was one day when I was sober so that I could understand it. A spider had built a spider web in the corner of my living room. And I went in there and, and I whammed it down out of the corner. And a little spider came boop on an invisible thread. And he was swinging back and forth. You could you could hardly see this thing. And he was hanging on like dynamite. And I put my mop back to kill that sucker. I have a hard time with them. They're so... But I'm sorry. But anyway, he, he was hanging on. And I thought, you know what? That's the same kind of hope my family was given. That's the same kind of hope we're given here in Alcoholics Anonymous. When life sometimes makes us sort of like pain on the inside. And we hang on to that invisible thread like that little spider. And like that little spider that I watched, I didn't stand there like an any poop. I, I, you know, I, every time I go by, I watch. And he climbed and rebuilt that web stronger and more beautiful and more mighty than before. And it was just because he hung on. 
And that's what I can do. The hope of hanging on, of climbing, of rebuilding what has been destroyed. And I remembered that little spider. And I remembered that when, when I started treating my family like I treated members of Alcoholics Anonymous. My eldest daughter is 32 years old. She's married. She has two children. And they live close enough for me to see. I incidentally love my grandchildren. I have one that's nine, Candace. She knows everything. Sometimes I ask Candace instead of God. I get a quicker answer. Um, and Adam is seven. And Billy is six. And Shannon is six months. You know what they've taught me? How to blow funny through a straw when I have a chocolate soda so the fizz comes up in my nose and makes me sneeze. They have made a pile of leaves. And you know what I do? I run and jump in them with them. And we throw them around and we laugh and we have a wonderful time. They got me down on my knees once and they said, look at that green thing coming up there, Grandma. Isn't that wonderful how that little green thing comes up there? There's a flower. They've taught me how to enjoy the smell of grass when it's mowed. How to walk through puddles in my bare feet. How to enjoy this thing called living. Children are wonderful, and I love them. And I remember one time when they were over for dinner, and I was climbing the stairs to go get them. And they were all sitting around upstairs. I heard Candace say, yeah, Grandma goes to that A-A-A-A thing. And... um she said, that's where you go when you don't want to drink that icky stuff anymore. And, because uh, once she did, and she acted like a lump, Mama said. And I heard one of my grandsons say, Grandma isn't a lump anymore because lumps don't hug. You know what that does? You know what that does? I love that. Love is just giving and not asking for anything in return, and you've taught me that. Annie stopped by the pew on the day she was married, and she, she hugged me. She said, thank God for AA, Mom. Thank God for this way of life. Linda, my second one in line, left us when she was 18. Linda is now 29. And all we said to her was, we don't like what you're doing, but we love you, and the door will all be o always be open. She ran off with a creep. And, <laughs> and she said, you know, it wasn't because, it was, I had been sober for quite a while, but she said it was something that was going on in the family. She's going through a very bad divorce right now. And she kept coming back because we left the door open, and we loved her. Sometimes we don't like what they do, but God, we love them. And I see her all the time. Please pray for her and her children. Bruce, my oldest son, is 27 years old. He's a paramedic. He also is the assistant manager of a cookie cupboard. He did not talk to me for the first three years I was sober. I'd sit at the table. He'd get up. I'd walk in the back door. He'd go out the front. And you know what you said? Just stay there and do the things that you're supposed to do. Keep going to his little league games. Keep doing all these things. And it will get better. And by better we mean that you'll be doing what you can do. Don't squash him in your hand. Don't make any demands. Let it be like a butterfly. Give him his freedom. And if he flies away and never comes back, then you weren't meant to have it now. And if it comes back, then you were meant to have it. I went to his games, and I'd sit in the stands, and he'd go home with somebody else. And I just kept going and kept talking to him over the years. And on that very warm July day, when he was pitching the final game of a little league game, he turned with a ball in his hand, and his eyes searched the stands, and he found mine. And he saluted me with a ball. And after the game was over, he said, you know, Mom, it doesn't make any difference if we win or we lose as long as you're here. 
and I was able to sit down with him and hug him and love him, and he and I are real good friends. The baby is 24 with an 18 and a half inch neck, John. John was seven when I came home to you. And I remember one day, I was home when he came home for lunch. And, and I, he came in through the back door and he said, I'm hungry, I want lunch. And I got terrified. I hadn't started to cook. I hadn't done anything. And I called my sponsor up and I said, what am I going to do? He wants lunch. And all of a sudden, this little baseball clap and big eyes came over the car and he said, I'll teach you how to make lunch. <laughs> and she heard him and she said, take the hand of this child. Let a child teach you. You got to crawl before you walk. Learn. So he took out the bread. He put it down like this, and he took out the peanut butter and the jelly, and he put peanut butter on one piece, and he said, Daddy said, you got to be careful. You make holes, and the jelly will fall through. And on the, other one he put, on the other one, he put jelly, and then he put them together, and he said, that's a sandwich. Now you make one. <laughs> And with tears pouring down my face, I made my first sober sandwich. <laughs> that wonderful man who glued those children together died of leukemia in 1978 after a two-year illness. <clears throat> I've never seen such courage in them. In my life. The day I found out, I walked out of his room. And my sponsor and two other A's, A's were sitting there and they said, we thought you'd like some coffee. And all through the two-year illness, you guys were there in the house. You stood me on my own two feet. You wiped tears from my eyes and the eyes from my family. You kept us laughing, and you loved us. Bruce and I did a lot of things. We went to Asheville. We were going to retire there. We went to Asheville, and we we took the ski ride up, and and we looked down below, and he said to me, I'll bet you this is what it's like someday. You look down below, and you see all that beauty. And we laughed, and we had a good time. And on July the 19th, he was six foot two and he weighed over 200 pounds. And on July the 19th, he weighed 103, he said, hey, let's dance. And we did. We put on Perry Como record. And we danced. And we sat down, sat down, and, and the children came downstairs and told us they thought we were nuts. And then we sat down and we read something that's real important that I'll read to you in a minute. On the 21st of July, he closed his eyes and we were all with him and he told us he loved us. And he said to me, thank God, Beth, for AA. It has given us so much. Your soul sometimes shreds up and I went outside and it was the most beautiful night I've ever seen. And I told this God of my life that I was sad. And all of a sudden, there was a calmness that came over me. And I knew I wasn't alone. And I knew that no matter what came into my life, with his grace and the power of this program, that it would be okay. This is quite a way of life. It teaches you to live. It teaches you to feel. It teaches you to love. It, it's just, for God's sake, if you're new, just stay in these meeting rooms. You know, nobody ever told me to keep coming back. They just said, stay here. Stay here. 
You just don't know what beauty it has. I do want to tell you one thing, though, about 12-step call, because I think this is pretty important. It was the first one. And my sponsor called me up, and she said, The hand has gone out. And I said, Oh, God. So we're going on a 12-step call. So she picked me up, and we went over to the house, and we went around the house, and the doors had been locked. And she said to me, Go in the garage and see if there's a ladder. I said, You're crazy. Guess we're breaking an error. <laughs> she said, When the hand goes out. So I went in, and I found an extension ladder, and she said, There's no window put it there. So I did. And she said, what are you holding it for? I said, I'm waiting for you to go up. She said, I'm not going anywhere. You are. (laughs) I said, I'm afraid of heights. She said, faith and fear don't dwell in the same house. Now get on with it. (laughs) So I went up. As I went over the ledge, I caught my foot. And I fell on the alcoholic who was prone on the floor with her bottle out like this. Now, what do you do when you fall on somebody who's laying on the floor? And all I said, did you call AA? (laughs) My kid said, I should tell you that one. You know that lady stayed sober till she died? She said, out of fear. Okay, on March 5th of this year, I got this letter for my children. It's a cute card. looks like Winnie the Pooh there in front. It says, it's nice to know that you're always there, and you are, Mom. We kids don't really know how to tell you thank you for 17 years of happiness. We guess the best way would be to copy the verse Daddy wrote in the Bible he gave you on your first day anniversary. Remember, you read it to Daddy and us a few days before he died. That's when Daddy again told us to thank God for your life and AA for continuing to teach you how to live in love and to care and just to just be. We changed the word I to we and the other first persons so that all your children and your grandchildren could be included. We love you not only for what you are, but for what we are when we are with you. We love you not only for what you have made of yourself, but for what you are making of us. We love you for ignoring the possibilities of the fool in us and for laying a firm hold in the good in us. We love you for closing your eyes to the discords in us and for adding to the music in us by listening. We love you because you are helping us to make of the lumber of our lives not taverns but temples and of the words of our every day, not a reproach, but a song. You have done it by learning to be yourself. Perhaps, after all, that is what AA means. We love you, Mother. You are a precious moment in our lives. Thank God for you. Thank God for AA. Keep trudging your road in your nows. And it's signed, Annie, Linda, Bruce, and John. And this is because of you. This is what you have done for me. My God, if I live a million years, I will never be able able to say thank you enough and to tell my God how grateful I am to him. And now may the road rise to meet you and the wind be always at your back and the sun shine warm upon your face and the rain fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand in the nows of each day. God bless you and go live. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.